Kwame Anwachi is the author, along with Joshua David Stein, the book Notes from a Young Black Chef. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for having uh, me. Uh, let's let's talk about what inspired this this book, and then we'll get into what inspired you to get into uh, the 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 restaurant uh, business, which has got to be a very difficult business, as you point out in your memoirs. Yeah, it's tough. It's a tough business. Um, but the the book really was. I was doing a speech in New York City. I was just telling my life story at a food conference uh, called Bitten. And there was a literary agent in the crowd. And after I came down from the speech, she approached me and said, you need to put this on paper. I think a lot of people need to, to read this and the story needs to be spread further than this this auditorium. And and, and what was her, inspir- what do you think inspired her? What did she tell you as you started talking to uh, uh, Joshua? Mm-hmm. Oh, to and you know because I'm in the process of putting a memoir together. It can be soul searching. Yeah, it can it. It's very cathartic. You yeah, know? it's yeah. very therapeutic. You know, um, you are reliving things that you put in the past and you know probably don't want to talk about ever again. Um, such as, such as you know you, things in your childhood. No, no, talk about this. I mean, in terms of you, in terms of me, yeah, you know, yeah, certain but, things. Just growing up was tough. You know, I grew up with a single mom in in, in the Bronx, New York, and it was um, it wasn't a glorious, or glamorous childhood upbringing. Um, you know, based off of being at home, also in my environment. You know, um, I say growing up in New York City, you, you you have to grow up fast, and you're left to your own laurels a lot. And if you're not around the right crowd, around the right environment, um, it can be a detriment. What kind of crowd were you around? Um, that was around a tough crowd, a rough crowd. You know, a, a group of kids in the neighborhood that um, maybe didn't have the best upbringing. Um, and it, you know, it reflected my life as well. Um, run in with the law? Yeah. Really? Mm-hmm. In terms of what? Uh, well, gang participation, you know, selling drugs, um, small petty crimes, things like that. So what in, in, in the memoir, you have to write about what turned you around. Mm-hmm. So w- what turned you around? What, uh, what did, what, what's in that book that, that folks ought to be reading that turned you around? It was, you know, it was a, a multitude of things, but I would say the most pivotal moment mm-hmm. of, in my life was seeing Obama walk across that stage. Really? Yeah. Now, at the time Obama walked, because I, I was in in the audience, you mean when he walked across stage after he had won? After he had won. So we were in Grant Park. Mm-hmm. Now, I was broadcasting. Michael Eric Dyson, I know it's been at your place, and mm-hmm. we'll talk about the restaurant, and I'm sitting there with, um, who else was there? Uh, Tom Joyner, mm-hmm. and we're broadcasting. We're all there together, and and Jesse Jackson was down there. Yeah. Tears were flowing. It was it was a very Oprah emotional was moment. There. Yeah. Where were you? I was in Bridgeport, Connecticut, doing what? I was supposed to be going to school, but I had gotten to heavy into dealing drugs, and I it, I had a party the night before. I woke up and in the super I don't even know what time it was but I just turned on the television and I saw him walking across stage now I had voted for him you know I I was gonna be a part you weren't that doped out you 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 no I I was voting I I, I wanted to be a part of this right you know this election so so there was that moment so you're looking at and so you see him walk across this black man walk across the stage and and 44 years 40 50 years prior to that uh, no, probably 44 years prior to that, we weren't even, we were still segregated. Jim Crow had just ended on paper. You know, that's not even the, the countless places that still weren't abiding to those rules. And here is this man who defied all all odds. And what am I doing with my life right now? And if he could become, you know, the highest ranking person in America, I can put my mind to something and become that as well. But you, had, I'm certain you had heard that from your mom. Yeah, but, you know, for me, I have to come to realization for things. I think a lot of people are like that, you know. Um, someone can tell you something, but until you realize it and you actualize it. And now, was, was this an instant transformation or was it a matter of time, over it, time? It was It was pretty instant. I mean, I 
sat down with my friend at the time who was a childhood friend and she also was just like what are you doing right now like this isn't who you are you were like the little boy with with glasses that <laughs> that lived a couple doors down from me and now you're like this quote unquote drug kingpin in Bridgeport Connecticut this isn't you and that you know the realization of someone who saw me grow up to seeing Obama walk across the stage I instantly went and I flushed everything that I had down the toilet. Come on. To eliminate any temptation. Now let me now now let me let me <laughs> let me point let me ask this very pointed question. How much was that? Probably two thousand dollars worth of that you flushed down the toilet. Yeah. Yeah. At that moment. And I was I think nineteen years old. Nineteen, eighteen, nineteen. I mean, I had just been able to to vote for the first time, so I remember that. Wow. And I flushed it down the toilet. I gave things away that I couldn't flush down the toilet, and I booked a ticket to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Why Louisiana? So my mother moved there when I graduated oh, high school. Okay, so you went to to be with your mom. I went to be with my mom. I had to hit the reset button. I had to find out. I had to find my passion. I had to find my voice, and I needed to find myself. More importantly, do you, do the, you write about in the book, uh, Kwame? Do you write about again? The book is Notes from a Young Black Chef. Mm -hmm. uh, do you write about what your mother's reaction was? Yeah, I mean, what what was her reaction? She was like, "Come home." She said, "Come home," you know. And I was down there for a little bit, and you know didn't really want to get a job because nothing was kind of nothing was going to equate to what I was making so it was like really tough for me in, to get in terms back of, into that in terms of monetary. drug money yeah exactly yeah okay gotcha so it was yeah. hard to assimilate back into um society I guess and you know she gave me a talk she was like you're either going to leave this house or you're going to get a job I mean I'm not going to just like be buying groceries for you and you're going to just be eating and not contributing anything so I went out and got a job and I got a job waiting tables making, yeah, in a restaurant, <laughs> in a restaurant making about like twenty dollars a day. And and now. All right. So now we're kind of moving in that direction. Yeah, exactly. Are we not? Yeah. So we're moving. So you're starting with waiting tables. I started waiting tables. Now it's a busboy kind of. It's like I was a waiter, but it was a rib shack. You know? Oh, OK. Yeah, yeah, all right. In, this in wasn't that. one of New Orleans <laughs> famous Finest, white no. cloth, white table cloth. Absolutely not. Not at all. It was a rib shack. And. You know, <laughs> one of the things that I noticed was, was there was a very, I, it, I mean, I never grew up in the South. So like my first time in the South, it was very, it was, it was black and white for, for better words. Like I was put in a section where they only sent black people to. And that section was like towards the back of the restaurant. And, and what year was this? This was uh, 12 years ago. Come on. Yeah. Really? Yeah, absolutely. It's very apparent. What's the name of the place? Uh, it was T.J. Rib Shack. I take it they don't do that anymore. I hope not. I hope not yeah. either. My goodness. Were the ribs that good? They were no, good. I, okay. <laughs> the ribs so anyway, I I'm, yeah. So anyway, so you you get so this is the first time you're really experienced. You didn't experience that up in the Bronx, no, and New no. York, and Connecticut, mm -hmm. and 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 that type of thing. No. Yeah. And and so you so you're now in a restaurant. You're now waiting tables, and mm -hmm. you were and so in the book you describe what is there? Uh, is this a beginning of another transformation? Yeah, it's the beginning of understanding that dynamic, you know, and understanding how to be black in that dynamic as well. What led you then? Walk us through the process that you write in in the book. Uh, walk us through the process of how this led to your culinary experience? Well, you know, I worked I worked there for a while and then I wanted to get into the kitchen. So I started washing dishes at another restaurant in, in Louisiana. And I started, you know, from there I went to another restaurant as a line cook. And then my mother was a chef. She had a, a catering company down there. She was the she was the executive chef for a catering company. In oh, Baton so this Rouge, is Louisiana. sort of in in your DNA then. Oh yeah. Oh okay. So Go my ahead. mother started yeah. a catering company from the house in the Bronx. Oh and okay. And me and my sister became her first two employees. And oh This okay. is when I was five years old. Oh well, okay. So this is in your DNA. So, I got you. So got when you. I got yeah. back down, when I first you know flew mm -hmm. down there, I just got I just started doing the only thing I knew how to do, which was work with food in any capacity. Mm -hmm. So I started to go into the dining room to 
because it's usually more money there that I still had the passion for cooking. So I jumped back into the kitchen and I was like back and forth. And then the real pivotal moment was the Deepwater Horizon oil spill that happened in the Gulf of Mexico. So they were paying like crazy amounts of money for these chefs to go out there and cook for like these pirates cleaning up this oil. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. All right. So I signed up and I spent, you know, three weeks on the water, one week off. Cooking. Now, you didn't have to cook gourmet type food, did I you? I didn't, you know, but I. What were you cooking? I also had no cell phone service, so I couldn't look up recipes. I had to just cook ah. from the heart. And I cooked food that my mother taught me how to make, you know. My mother's Creole. She's okay. from, oh, uh, right. our family's from Louisiana. So, you know, shrimp etouffee, shrimp Creole, you know, gumbo, red beans and rice, you know, jambalaya. I, I cooked things like that, coupled with, you know, things from my, my heritage on my father's side as well, and, and from, which is Jamaican and Nigerian. Okay. So people really enjoyed it. And I became the head chef of the boat within the first month of me being there. And you were how old? I was approximately 19, 20 years old. <laughs> really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. All so, right. so that's when I first was like, I was ordering food. I was creating the menus. Right. I was directly cooking for people, giving it to them and seeing their reaction. And there's when I got hooked to that. And that, and that was that transformation. Yeah. Now, usually when we, when we have talked to celebrated chefs like yourself and, and we should, point out that and we should have started with congratulations winning the james uh the james beard yeah award. Absolutely. thank you i appreciate yeah, it. that which is a very prestigious award for any chef to get usually they have said to us here on the show there was always a mentor or someone who really pushed them on that they modeled their career after any such person in your life well, yeah, I had a couple throughout my throughout my life. Uh, my mother was definitely a huge mentor professionally um, and at home. Um, there was a professor at culinary school named Bruce Mattel was a mentor as well. He was from the Bronx and really like took me under his wing. Um, James Kent at Eleven Madison Park as another mentor, you know, and like you find these these um, icons throughout your life that are there in in that specific point in your life to get you to the next point. And but getting to the next point in in the memoir again notes from a young black chef. I mean this was no crystal stair step. You didn't take the elevator up to the top where you are now. No. And you do write about discrimination. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it talk to us a moment about that. What kind of discrimination are we talking about? I mean, we're dealing with modern times. We're talking about the 80s, the 90s, aren't we not? Mm -hmm. And so what, I mean, literally the 90s and plus. So what kind of discrimination were you facing in the culinary field? Well, you know, I think modern times, you know, it, it, do, it does lend to better times, you know, speaking with my grandparents and what they've gone through. But there are things that are systematic that they don't, they still don't go away overnight or over decades or over a century, you know. And I would say the harshest form of racism that I've experience in these restaurants is the unspoken racism and that is that is the constant constantly being looked over for a position that is constantly training people and you know and you you are the one that's not getting promoted you know not being included in so you a, like for example you and correct me if i'm wrong you start off maybe you're in a you're a sous chef well you know you start well, off as like prep normally prep yeah but you get looked over if you want to be the, uh, yeah the next step. like to go on to the line or something like okay that. yeah and and, um, and 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 you're looked over you believe because you are an african-american i think it, it attributed to it whether it was uh spoken conscious, or not yeah. spoken or not conscious or subconscious um it, you know i think you could probably relate to this the closer you get to the top in any industry yeah. Yeah. the less there are people that look like you and, and, and there's a there's a level of uncomfortability on both sides that comes with that. So how do how did you overcome it? Because well, that that's in the book. How did you overcome it? Well, I put my head down a lot and I pushed through it and I knew that I had a goal to attain um, to obtain. And I, I had to obtain. I had to I had to I had to see that goal and I had to believe that goal. And I I didn't let anything get in my way, whether it was subconscious, conscious, spoken or unspoken. 
um, I had to continue to just push through to get to where I wanted to be. We're kind of skipping around the book a little bit. Um, so let's talk about the your New York experience mm-hmm. opening. If that, if that's one, I mean, opening up a restaurant any city is difficult. New York. When the first restaurant that you opened that mm-hmm. was yours was where? The first restaurant I opened was in Washington D.C. In Washington D.C. Mm-hmm. And 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 the and experience it, it wasn't really mine, but it was. What, now, what do you mean by that? Um, well, you know, on paper and everything, or well, not even on paper, but in in the public, it was perceived that it was my restaurant, but it wasn't. You were the one being interviewed. I was the one being interviewed. But you were in an interview that stories were being written about. I we here in Washington were reading them mm-hmm. and rushing to the restaurant, and but you're saying it really wasn't yours. Yeah. So, you know, it's very expensive to open up a restaurant. You know, that's just point blank period. And it takes a lot of work and capital even after you open up that restaurant. So a lot of time to take on partners or investors to open up said project. Um, In this instance, I wasn't even granted uh, any percentage of ownership until after, I believe it was two years after it was open. So initially, it it still wasn't my restaurant. I was an employee. um, And I had a lot, there was a lot of, behind the scenes um, decisions that were being made that were then reflected upon me. Such as? Such as the pricing of the restaurant, you know, certain elements of the restaurant that I didn't really want, but I had to conform to. You but, know? You're, but you're the face of the restaurant. Yeah. So who are your investors? Um, there were a couple guys here in D.C. And... And so how did that experience transform you? Uh, it led me to ask better questions, you know, and, you know, make sure I know exactly what I'm signing up for. Failure or success? Talk about that for a moment. What the, let's talk about, first of all, what, what success did you have? And and you also document the failure, mm-hmm. and then that'll lead us because you just didn't quit after that. No. So let's talk about the success. Obviously, was getting in, get you know, opening it up and and running it. But the failure was what? Because the failures teach us lessons. Yeah. Too. I mean, I would say the failure was not asking enough questions in the beginning, being so excited about something that mm-hmm. I wasn't really understanding everything. That. Um, Everything that was in store, you know, I, w- I wasn't asking questions about how much money were we spending on, you know, furniture, how much money are we spending on the kitchen, how much how much working capital do we have after we open? And what are they telling you? It's none of your business. You just cook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, don't worry about it. We got it. We don't worry got, about uh, it. We, we got, got it. it. Don't you worry. Yeah, about don't it. Worry you just about go it. ahead and do yeah. your do the thing. interviews, do cook yeah. the food. You be the face, stuff. cook yeah. the face. Okay. And we got it. And, you know, I should have asked more questions and that's on me. But I think that the real failure is in not trying something, you know, and I don't look at it as like. Now, what do you mean not trying something? Not trying something that you want to do. Oh, OK. And looking back on that is like, man, I wish I would have I wish I would have done that. And your advice to other young because in a sense, you're an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, probably in the restaurant business, the ultimate entrepreneur because you've got everything. It's not just financial investment. Uh, and bringing that up, do you talk in the book, and we're talking, uh, the, the, the book is Notes from a Young Black Chef. Do you talk about, because I'm always fascinated at how many hours you have to spend on site. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I talk about that. It's a lot. What's a lot? 16-hour days. You just just every waking hour, you've got to be there. Yeah, especially in the beginning, especially to set uh-huh. the standards. You know, I remember at Kith and Kin, because it's open for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I'd be there from six a.m. to one a.m. for the first three months, and I lived yeah. in the hotel upstairs. Yeah, yeah. Now, and that that leads us to the success you have now. And I'll bring this because people around the country mm-hmm. are, are are you know, and and I have to tell you, it's one of our favorite. Uh, places uh, probably the first restaurant that uh, we went to when the wharf opened mm-hmm. that's the hottest new place now in, yeah in, in DC. washington <laughs> dc um and uh i i'll be honest with you uh now this sidetracks from the book 
I love those oxtails. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love those oxtails. Well, there's a recipe in the book, so no, it's not too so sidetracked. So wait a minute. So in the book, you, you also have recipes. Yeah, it's based off my grandmother. You know, she's, she's yeah. Jamaican, so um, it's something that I grew up eating. Um, so the recipe's in there. Um, and, and, and so anybody else who has failed, sometimes they can pick themselves up and sometimes they can't. You picked it. You, I mean, you didn't let that stop you. Yeah. And and you decided that now this this let's talk about this kitten Ken that this that that was a because I'm thinking that's a hell of a gamble because this is a brand new upscale kind of <laughs> location yeah. and you've got a whole wharf full of competition yeah yeah and and so any hesitation on your part or were no. you ready to go I was ready to go I was extremely excited to celebrate my culture in a way that I, have, that I don't feel has been done before. And, um, you know, competition is a good thing. It keeps you sharp, it keeps you on your feet, it keeps you want to make, put out something at least equal or better than, than the person next to you. So um, for me, it was like a no-brainer to do this concept. Um, and I was excited. And, you know, I think that's what real success is, you know, going into every single project with the same excitement as the last. And so, so let's talk. This so this sort of my culture, which includes, and you've sort of hinted around inclusiveness mm -hmm. in your uh, in your kitchen. So describe how that works, because you again, that's that's part of the memoir. Yeah, well, you know, I have a lot of chefs of color and um, female um, female chefs as well that gravitate towards me for some reason, and I think it's because the restaurant is a safe place, but also they see someone that looks like them. And I think your age, too, because these probably are a lot of mostly young people mm -hmm. and their attitude, if you can do it, yeah, I, can, exactly. I, I can do it, they too. Can, they see themselves in me. Yeah. And that's, I mean, I think that right there is is something worth fighting for. Now, the, now okay, so here we are. Uh, we both know the area. We both know the neighborhood. And I have to ask you, do you still face to any degree discrimination? Um, I think it's the subtle discrimination that it's like a purveyor coming in and not knowing that I'm the chef, you know? It's like, it, it's now it's not with the public, it's with like in the private life um, or the quote unquote back of the house, you know? So it's that, I laugh it off now, I used to get extremely irritated by it. No, wait a minute, when I was the younger. back of the house, he talk, he explain that. So that, me. you know, you have the front of the house, yeah, and that's right, where the diner right. see, and the back of the house is, you yeah, know, the kitchen, kitchen the back door, that. you know, yeah. the, the loading dock, and I have I have those issues. Oh, in other words, they see you. <laughs> yeah, and but they're like, they, where's they, the chef? Where's the chef? Yeah, <laughs> look, I, I get sometimes, they walk in here, and like, yeah. and, and, it's, and I bet you sometimes, correct me if I'm wrong, Sometimes it's how did you get this? Mm -hmm. Not knowing the story you just told us exactly. and, and and created and 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 put in the yeah, book. I get it a lot. I mean, I get it with my age too. And they're like, "Wait a minute, how old are you? You could be my son." <laughs> I'm like, "Man, let me just sign this thing, man, and, and sign <laughs> yeah, and get you paid." <laughs> yeah, let me, let's can we move on? That, that is irrelevant. <laughs> so, and, and 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 as we as we conclude again, the book is notes from a young black chef. Um, and, and, and can we, uh, well, they, they just was telling me, and we should mention the fact that this could be, they've bought, they've bought rights to the book. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Now, who do you want to play you? <laughs> Luckily, I have an actor already signed up. Really? Yeah. Lakeith Stanfield. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And it, so th then the guy, I guess, the, you know, I'm, it, it's fascinating because you, you, you know, I wonder how they will what artistic uh, license they'll take uh, take with it. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm hoping, you know, under, you know, whatever influence I can have that the book, the movie will be of a, a direct depiction of the book and it won't veer too much off. It won't have too you much hope. poetic I license. Know it. Yeah. I know, you hope. Because there are, a lot of, there are a lot of great stories in there that can be told, you know. I don't think that we need to fabricate anything. Mm -hmm. Um but um, I'm excited about the process. Really. Yeah. Oh, you should be. Yeah. You really should be. And final, finally, if, if, what do you want folks to walk away with, no matter what their age, but if you want to delineate in terms of 
the audience, what do you want people to walk away with when they read uh, Kwame, the book Notes of a Young Black Chef? What do you want them to walk away and understand? I want them to understand a different perspective of life, you know, something that they may not be familiar with. And if they are familiar with this perspective of life, that anything is possible as long as you put your mind to it. And I know that's very cliche. Well, it is, but I, I, because having, when we started this conversation, where you, see, I'm not thinking about just the success of the restaurant, but I'll go back to what really impressed me. And that was, you're watching, a, you're watching television, you see a fellow African, quote, mm -hmm. African-American, become president of the most powerful country on the planet mm -hmm. and you drop two thousand dollars worth of drugs in a toilet mm -hmm. and and then from there bam there's a transformation yeah and it wasn't overnight no no it wasn't overnight yeah yeah, yeah. you got to go home you got to face the music exactly. with your mother. <laughs> exactly. Am I right? And you got to hit that reset button. And you got to hit that reset button probably a few times. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Because there had to be temptations back. And, and, you, and you admitted this. I, you know, I'm, I'm making, I'm, I'm, look, I'm flushing $2,000 down the toilet. Now I'm working a $20, yeah. uh, you know, dollar a day job, mm -hmm. you know, awaiting tables. Yeah. It's an amazing <laughs> transformation. It really is. Well, thank you. It, no, and it's an amazing, and, and so for, wait a minute, because somebody's going to say, mm -hmm. uh, uh, before they buy the book, and, you know, and I appreciate you coming in, they're going to, how would you, uh, please have him describe the restaurant. What's the menu? What's it, what, <laughs> what is it like? We know where it is. Well, we have four pillars of cuisine there. You know, it's right. Creole, Trinidadian, Jamaican, and Nigerian. I never knew that. I just thought it was all good food but anyway <laughs> exactly. so so i'm gonna go ahead <laughs> go ahead so you know we like to explore that and, and also the rest of the diaspora but it really follows because of my culture the the slave trade you know from west africa to the caribbean to the american south and we follow that food and we tell the story of those people that are inaudible in this industry and you say you tell that story in the food you tell that story in the food yeah huh you know, because you can experience a culture on a plate. Well, that's true. That's absolutely true. Yeah. yeah. Well, look, I uh, I really appreciate you coming in. Again, the book, Notes from a Young Black Chef. Kwame, make sure I pronounce it right. Yes. I'm watching. I'm right? watching. There you go. Thank you. And and that's O-N. We were trying to figure it out, but it, now that I'm reading it, O-N-W-U-A-C-H-I. Yes. And... Um, I, I really first of all I'm certain you'll 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 see us but we'll we we okay. clearly appreciate you coming in and again congratulations Thank on you. the on the award Thank I mean you so that much. is that is a very prestigious award and we, and wish you uh, continued success any plans for uh, opening up a another one we'll see you know there's there's nothing but space and opportunity. Um, so I'm taking my time, you know. But right. And it, the book is available online? The book is available where all books are sold. So online in bookstores. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, let's put it, if gang, on our uh, Facebook and our bookshelf, my uh, bu my uh, bookshelf. So we'll get it up on our Facebook. Okay. And, and they, they take care of the social, social media. media yeah, stuff, they yeah. got it. I got the book. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, I'll have you autograph you. it if you don't mind. I got you. All right. Okay. Thanks a lot. We'll continue here more with Madison on Sirius XM Urban View.